Hello and welcome to KubeCon Europe 2023. This is Kubernetes Signot intro and deep dive. And uh, today uh, your speakers are Don Chen from Google, Derek Carr from Red Hat, Sergey Kanjeli from Google, and Brunal from Red Hat. We all are chairs and TLs of uh, Signot, and we're happy to present you uh, what's happening with Signot and uh, what you're working on. Before we begin, please uh, remember to uh, be nice to each other and uh, read our code of conduct if you're interested. Previously, we updated uh, community on Signot achievements and covered everything happened up to 126 of Kubernetes at KubeCon North America 2022. You can ha find recording and slides, um, everything available online. So if you're interested in what was happening before, please go there. Uh, we covered uh, interesting deep dives uh, during that presentation. Uh, you may be interested in uh, Cgroup v2 and uh, in place memory, in place pod upgrade. Today we will cover, we will uh, go into Signot overview again. Uh, we will talk about Signot uh, areas of interest, and then we can deep dive into Kubelet resource management. After that. We will talk about what was happening in 126 and 127, what are our plans for 128, and we'll go into one of the highlights of uh, recent developments in sidecar containers. Finally, we will talk about leadership updates and how, the ways you can be involved into our community. With all that, let's go to Signot overview. Signot is uh, responsible for many things happening on the Kubernetes nodes. Uh, it consists of multiple areas as kubelet. Uh, it uh, talks about uh, node and pod life cycle, how they managed and what kind of stages they're going through. It also talks about resource management. And uh, during the today presentation, we'll go deep into resource management specifically. And also communicates with operating systems through the container runtimes. Our charter is uh, to be responsible for all the components that control interaction between pod and host resources. Signot is vertical seek, so we control specific area of uh, code. Uh, and opposed to some horizontal seeks like SIG instrumentation, uh, vertical seek means that uh, we own specific components. And if uh, somebody wants to change any feature uh, touching this component, we need to be involved. And we have multiple sub projects. Beyond one of the uh, horizontal sub project is CI sub project that uh, doing some uh, uh, where we watch for reliability of uh, components of Signode and uh, looking at the CI status. We also have sub projects by specific components. We have sub project for Kubelet, uh, for container runtime interface, uh, for node problem detector, something that will detect the uh, notify you about the issues with your nodes, and many more. With all that, I want to go uh, pass, uh, pass to Derek, and uh, Derek will go into Kubelet resource management. Thanks, Sergey. Uh, so as Sergey noted in Signode, uh, one of our primary responsibilities is to figure out how to give uh, pods access to host resources and how to make sure those resources are fairly shared among pods or containers on that same node. So today, uh, Kubelet supports a, a number of resources, uh, CPU, memory, disk, ephemeral storage, um, that you often see in your pod specs when, as an application deployer, you're deploying to Kubernetes. Uh, then there are some uh, resource types that you don't see in the foreground in your pod spec that the Kubelet is managing in the background uh, for fair sharing. One of those would be things like PIDs. And we're also uh, supporting frameworks in the background to allow device plugins, for example, to uh, advertise uh, dynamic resources uh, for you to consume your application. Um, basically, this is a rich set of uh, growing uh, and uh, diverse uh, set of resources that we need to manage uh, in the SIG. Next slide. So when, uh, if you're interested in understanding how we in the SIG approach this problem around uh, advertising uh, a resource, oftentimes uh, community members come to the SIG and say, there's a new uh, entity that we want to make uh, known within Kubernetes, whether that's a new device, a new uh, a class of resource, or a new specialization on one of those resources. One of the first questions uh, that we have to ask is, you know, how, how do we want to make that resource known? How does the user 
uh, express an intent to desire it? And then how do how do we model it relative to like the concrete representation of that resource? A lot of times we don't think as a Kubernetes user, what does it mean when I claim uh, one or two or three CPUs? But we in the SIG are then responsible for figuring out, for example, how that maps to fractional shares in a C group uh, scheduling system. Many resources can be static and they never change over the life of a node. Other resources are dynamic and how we then reflect that back up to the, the control plane and the scheduler are important questions to, to reason through. And then particularly for some of the items that we're exploring in the future, uh, we have to be very careful to avoid node bootstrapping loops. You know, we have to make sure that the kubelet can work absent the presence of this resource being uh, known. And uh, it's, it's a perpetual challenge to have to always reason through these things. So next slide. So at the end of the day, users are uh, wanting to make a claim on a resource. So some resources are uh, fixed and uh, things like memory uh, or disk space, uh, you can very easily count how much of that resource you want and you can make sure that then you can hold that uh, container or pod within that you know, allocated budget. Other resources we could sometimes describe as non-countable, and these might be class-based resources where you're just trying to give a certain service quality uh, around that resource uh, that a pod can express. So if you have a new resource that you're interested in having the SIG understand or uh, articulate, it, one of the first questions is, is it actually counted or not? Similar to that, not all resources can be uh, overcommitted. In Kubernetes, you can make a request for a minimal amount of resource, where on the kubelet, we guarantee that you will get that resource at minimum. You will never get less than that. Uh, you'll make sure that you always have that reservation of a resource. And we, we map that to the request field. For resources that can be overcommitted, uh, we allow you to give a separate field, which we call a limit. And so for example, you can say a container can get between one and two CPUs at any given time or between one gig and two gigs of memory at any given time. Uh, but not all resources can be overcommitted. A good example of that would be something like uh, huge pages, where right now, for example, if you have to have a pod that requests the huge page, you you have, uh, you have cannot overcommit that resource. You, you basically request a, a certain amount of huge pages, and you can't uh, schedule out more of those than exist on the node. And then as we're thinking about these resource problems, mostly we're trying to make sure that the this cluster scheduler can make an informed scheduling decision. But uh, we also have to keep in mind that there's a certain amount of overhead uh, to just support running the management components on the node or the life cycle of the pod itself. Um, and so we have to do work to sometimes figure out ways to make that reservation known so that the cluster in the end is more reliable. If you're interested in scheduling problems to say what's the best node to fit a given uh, budget, that's typically the domain of SIG scheduling. And a lot of these resource management problems are worked across uh, these two SIGs. But if you're interested in figuring out how to make sure that like the request is actually fulfilled once scheduled, that, that's where SIG node really uh, shines. Next slide. So other things that are typically beyond the kubelet but come up when thinking about how to support new resources are things like uh, limit ranges, where you can say a policy rule that says a pod in a given namespace must request between one or two CPUs, right? Or it must request no less than five megs of RAM and no more than 100 gigs of RAM. You have a way of setting very subtle poli uh, like policy windows that uh, can define valid resource requests. Um, and so that's the domain typically of the limit ranger. And if you have a new resource, it sometimes is worthwhile asking, do cluster admins benefit from being able to constrain uh, the windows uh, of consumption for that given resource? Uh, and then typically even more important than that is uh, resource quotas, which basically deals with ensuring uh, the amount of that resource that a given namespace can claim in your cluster as a whole. So a lot of users in the world will partition their Kubernetes clusters into a set of, of namespaces and they want to control one namespace's ability to consume all resources relative to another. And 
if there's a reasonable expectation that your your the resource you want to introduce into Kubernetes might be viewed as precious or scarce, it's often important to then ask, should it be incorporated into quota? Um, next slide. So once the scheduler, once the kubelet knows how to advertise your new resource, and once the scheduler uh, then wants to schedule that resource, the kubelet sees that the pod uh, has been scheduled to that node, and it runs its own local admission check. So a lot of people are familiar in Kubernetes today with admission controllers or webhooks that can extend the Kubernetes control plane and intercept uh, control plane API requests. Uh, similar to that, complementary on the node, uh, we make admission decisions that intercept pod uh, scheduling acknowledgements on the kubelet and ensure that kubelet could actually uh, meet the needs expressed by that pod. And but we'll do checks to ensure that the resources are actually available on that node to support that pod. And in some cases, for more exotic or specialized node local topology decisions, it might uh, make higher order checks. For example, it'll say, this pod wants to use one CPU and it also wants a GPU and it has expressed the desire for those two things to be co-located on a common NUMA node. For some of those node local topology decisions, a scheduler at the cluster level doesn't have that total system view. And only at the kubelet is that system view known today, for example. And so the kubelet has to ask, do we actually have the feasibility constraints satisfied on that node to make it? This is an area where we continue to, to try to improve or get better on. And as an area where uh, folks, if they're interested in trying to uh, uh, help contribute to the SIG, uh, it's, it's an area where we try to avoid any race conditions or false positives or false negatives uh, with accepting that workload. Because at the end of the day, the goal would be once the pod is scheduled, we want to have a good confidence that the pod will run. Next slide. Once the qubit uh, acknowledges the desired intent of that pod being run on that node, oftentimes then the qubit has to start the process of allocating or reserving resources for that node. Many uh, resources that the qubit allocates are uh, stateless and oftentimes just controlled by C groups. And for example, if a pod is uh, designing a particular amount of CPU or memory, this allocation step you can think of as the kubelet just creating the C group structure that constrains the pod. Um, but then there are other resource types uh, which might require the kubelet to do something new. For example, if your pod has a an empty dir and it wants to store a state independent of a container backed by memory, you know, the kubelet might need to go and allocate a, a, a location on TempFS to fulfill that request. And you can imagine uh, for other types of uh, resources, um, particularly for new emergent class-based resources we're exploring, uh, you might want to dynamically attach a given uh, device to that node to fulfill that request. A lot of things that uh, we have to explore in this area. And then typically we need to make sure that when that pod is completed that we can clean up any allocations. Uh, and we wanna know when that allocation has been uh, confidently deallocated as a part of the pod lifecycle, because ultimately at the end of the day, a new pod is gonna run on that node and expect those resources uh, available to it. Next slide. As we discussed earlier, some resources are um, over-provisioned uh, and can support over-provisioning. Uh, not all can, and we said earlier, if if you uh, are interested in exploring new resources in the Kubernetes community, this is one of the first questions we would want to ask. A good way of highlighting this is uh, uh, today a given node uh, may run on, a given node may support many pods. And in effect, while each pod is making a request for a certain amount of CPU, that CPU, the set of concrete CPUs that are running in that pod are, are shared on that node. Uh, and ultimately, they're, they're kind of, kind of a timeshare on that CPU time. Other resources, you can imagine things like uh, GPUs. When you want a GPU in your pod, typically that GPU is for your pod and no others, right? And that would be an example of a resource that is uh, not over-provisioned. For a certain set of our resources, we have a concept of a quality of service class, which says 
dependent on how you request and limit particular resources, we might say you go into a guaranteed quality of service bucket versus like a burst of a bucket. And in cases where you're in that guaranteed quality of service class, we might support very uh, higher order node local optimizations to give you greater performance benefit for your workload. So for example, if you have a, if you make a request for an exclusive CPU and you want a GPU at the same time, you probably want those two things close on the physical host. So lots of interesting things to think through on this one. Next slide. At the end of the day, uh, you're running your workloads on nodes and you want to know what, are you actually properly sizing your workloads? Um, how much resources are your workloads actually using in production? Our goal in Signode is to make sure that you can make the most optimal resource, optimal usage of your resources as possible so that you can get the best density and the best utilization in your uh, environment. So typically then when a new resource is explored, we want to follow up with questions on how do we know it's being used? So if it's counted, for example, is it being observed in uh, things like C Advisor? Uh, is it being fed back into metrics loops for monitoring stacks to scrape and measure? Um, and then beyond that, once some of these things can be measured, the question becomes, can we support other adjacent SIGs abilities to make better dynamic resource resizing requests? So a lot of neat things can come out of this. Um, so next slide. Um, sometimes the, the node, particularly for overcommitted resources, may find that the actual amount of resource being used is greater than that which is available on the node. And unfortunately, when that happens, you have to make a, a decision about what to do. And so there's capabilities in the Kubelet today uh, that when we think about new resources, we have to ask, like, if this resource is scarce, what to do? What do we do when scarcity occurs? And when thinking about new resources, we often then think about how to handle those problems and then how quickly can we handle those problems when they occur. So for example, if uh, the, the node is running low on available memory because pods are using more than they actually requested, uh, the kubelet might make a decision to evict a lower priority pod relative to another um, that's consuming more than what it requested. Uh, and ultimately, it makes those decisions so that workload can be rescheduled to another location. And we want to make sure that uh, the, the workloads remain healthy on the node that are still there. Next slide. And in summary, hopefully from this brief overview, you can sense that resource management uh, in, touches a lot of topics around uh, API modeling, the life cycle of a node, the life cycle of a pod, the health of a host. And uh, it's actually quite a complicated topic that takes a large number of people's uh, collective brain power to reason through. A lot of these resources are very specialized and have uh, subtle behaviors that's hard for any one of us to keep in mind. So if you're interested in this space, I think we're all uh, happy for uh, more collective brain power to be brought to the problem. There's a few areas that we're exploring uh, today that are highlighted here. I'll just call it a few. The one, of course, is we want workloads to be more performant and more optimized on the nodes they run. And so better understanding the, the, the node local topology and the NUMA space has been an uh, interest of ours of late, as well as being able to expand to a greater set of resources or specialized resources, whether that's network bandwidth or any other class-based entities. Um, exciting work ahead. And with that, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Manal. There's been a focus on not keeping betas forever since 120. Uh, next slide. So we've done a bunch of uh, work to either deprecate or graduate lingering betas. So these are some of the features that were uh, either graduated or deprecated. Next slide. So these are the features that we graduated in 126 and 127. So device plugins, CPU manager, downward API for huge pages, kubelet uh, credential providers, and topology manager was graduated in 127. Next slide. So that said, we still have a bunch of work to do because we still have some features that are stuck in beta. And as a SIG, we are trying to either graduate them or deprecate them. So as we go into 128 planning, we'll try to address as many as we can. So let's take a look at what we did during 126 and 127. These are the three new features that we want to highlight in 126. So first of them is dynamic resource allocation. It's a whole new API to request, share, initialize, and clean up resources. 
it's like a generalized version of how storage is accessed today. So I would encourage you to either read a blog or watch another talk about this feature. It's an exciting new feature that opens up uh, possibilities like splitting the GPU into multiple slices and using them from pods. So the next one is event at Plague Alpha. So typically, Kubelet relists the pods and containers from the container runtime every few seconds. And this puts a lot of load on both the Kubelet and the runtime. So evented plague is an effort to make the updates evented rather than frequent relisting. So the alpha was added in 126. And then we added improved multi-numa alignment options uh, to the topology manager in 126. So 127, we landed a lot of stuff. A couple of GAs to call out. First, the gRPC container probe support. Second is seccom default. It enables better security by default. Then the evented plague moved to a beta. Another one to call out is the in-place pod vertical scaling. So this was a big effort. It took a lot of time uh, from community as well as reviewers and approvers to get it right. So it basically allows you to resize pod resources without having to restart them by adjusting the C groups. And it will be useful in various auto-scaling scenarios. Then we added some uh, other utility features like uh, kubelet tracing, which allows you to hook, add open telemetry tracing and then look at the traces of what's happening through the kubelet as requests are flowing in. Then we made some improvements to uh, image pulls. So we have better control over how many images are being pulled at the same time. Uh, what's coming up next? We have sidecar containers that Sergey is going to cover in more detail soon. Then we did some initial work in Swap. Uh, we want to explore the next steps there and see if we can provide more controls over what percentage of Swap can be uh, accessed by the workloads. Also, another intersection here is with C groups V2, once we enable Swap support, it allows us to enable the user space OOM killer like OOMD. So we have uh, better predictability in which container and pods are OOM killed compared to what the kernel does today. Then there'll be further improvements in DRA. Uh, hopefully we'll graduate event based on feedback. And we have uh, a, a couple of enhancements in the area of image pools. So there's a lot, lot of other topics also being explored. So we encourage you to come and join uh, Signal planning meetings and uh, help us uh, move things forward. So next, uh, Sergey is going to cover sidecar containers. Thank you, Bruno. Lots of uh, exciting things happening in uh, Kubernetes and uh, Signode. This, uh, I want to talk uh, in details about uh, sidecar containers. Sidecar containers is a concept uh, was introduced a long time ago. I don't even have a date, uh, but uh, it was used for a long time. And people were using it for many continuously running uh, pods that uh, they're running typically for web services and such. Uh, sidecars were introduced to uh, supp support generic uh, functionality like logging, log forwarding, or like metrics co co collecting, uh, stuff like that. And uh, it worked reasonably fine with uh, uh, all the long running ports and continuously running ports that needs to be, uh, that never finishes. With uh, Kubernetes growing and supporting more workloads, we start uh, putting more emphasis on jobs. Uh, besides other improvements we're doing for jobs and batch-like workloads, uh, we see that sidecar pattern is not working for jobs. Uh, when you start a job or like uh, any batch uh, workload that has a completion, uh, sidecars will prevent pods from being terminated and uh, removed. So people were coming up for, with uh, very uh, various workarounds to support sidecars for jobs. And jobs indeed needs uh, need sidecars. Uh, typical example is uh, log forwarding for metrics collection. You want to know what's happening with uh, uh, metrics on your job. You want to understand the status of it, the state of it. And uh, having generic sidecar uh, allowing uh, helping with that is very useful. Another example uh, where sidecars start uh, being uh, useful is service mesh, various uh, uh, proxy that uh, people install in a port. Uh, we can monitor 
connections from into port and from the port uh, we can um, uh, look what's happening in these connections uh, modify this connection and force some security on that uh, it's all important scenarios uh, before built-in support for sidecar containers service meshes worked reasonably well with uh, continuously running tasks so they have the same problem as uh, of port termination as with uh, uh, jobs but uh, for regular containers they work fine the only problem was that init containers wasn't covered with service mesh so if you have a init container that needs to utilize all the security benefits that service mesh provides you wasn't able to express it uh, with typical uh, tooling uh, uh, provided by kubernetes built in so we wanted to address this problem as well and there are many scenarios when sidecars are used for continuously updating secrets uh, or uh, reading some configuration files it's also a generic uh, task that can be uh, implemented in single container and it will be nice to have it uh, implemented as a sidecar uh, that wouldn't terminate or wouldn't uh, prevent pod from termination we worked on uh, in 127 on proposal uh, for sidecar containers and uh, the proposal is we wouldn't introduce any sidecar term into uh, uh, kubernetes api what we will do is we will uh, allow init containers to run continuously so some unique containers will be marked with the restart policy always, which will indicate to us that this container is a sidecar and it needs to start uh, uh, the same order as all other unique containers, but it will other unique containers will not wait for its termination so it will, or completion. So it will uh, start running. Uh, other unique containers will wait for sidecar to get into started state. So startup probes will uh, complete this successfully. And after that, all other new containers will run or regular containers will run, but this container will keep running. And if it uh, fails, even if it fails on port marked with restart policy never, it will keep being restarted because you want to keep monitoring or uh, log forwarding your job, even if uh, uh, your log forwarder crashed or was killed uh, for some reason. I wanted to talk a little bit about development process for this feature. Um, we uh, This uh, feature was... Uh, proposed long time ago and we've been working on implementation the difficulty was at uh, api surface and uh, any api surface was hard to agree on and uh, we needed to uh, make sure that it's a uh, future proof and uh, we went back and forth between very simple implementation very uh, complicated implementation we end up creating a working group to uh, lock on decisions and make it more efficient to go through these uh, conversations and this working group was uh, very successful over time we locked on decisions relatively quickly and then uh, proceeded with uh, implementation uh, description of implementation steps and in terms of implementation steps we took some lessons from other uh, major uh, caps uh, from the past and we split our work into some refactoring uh, that we do before api change and then uh, some big pr that will go with api change uh, including uh, specific features we want to support out uh, as a mvp product and then after api change you want to uh, catch up with additional features and uh, uh, this is mostly to make sure that big pr that uh, will land it will not be overwhelmingly big it will not take uh, too much time to maintain and too uh, long for approvers to review and uh, with that i wanted to thank everybody oh status of it uh, we have a pr work in progress pr in 127 but we didn't merge it uh, for multiple reasons and one of that is uh, we didn't want to put two major features in one uh, release uh, 127 so we likely will merge in early 128 this is the plan and we still have uh, some open questions for follow-ups for after alpha uh, it's primarily termination ordering and uh, how we gracefully terminate uh, sidecars how we uh, allow ordering of termination with that i wanted to say thank you for people participating in the working group i just took uh, a list from um, all the notes uh, thank you everybody uh, who joined and uh, gave your opinion or presented something and i want to uh, have special shout out to people who was implementing this uh, work in progress pr thank you uh, we really appreciate uh, everything happening and uh, sidecar supposed to like promise to be very uh, successful and very uh, needed feature is that i want to pass to derek uh, to go through the leadership update
Uh, thanks, Sergey. So since our last uh, meeting, uh, many of you who track our mailing list might have seen an update to the SIG's leadership structure. So it's been a long-term goal of ours to support growth of uh, new, new uh, members in the SIG. And one way uh, that we've done that is to uh, split our chair and technical lead roles within the SIG uh, and its corresponding governance uh, and recognize uh, my co-presenters here as uh, I want to thank uh, both Sergey and Renal as agreeing to step up and take the chair uh, role in the SIG, uh, which was relieving both Don and myself uh, from that uh, role uh, and helping make sure that the SIG runs smooth and is executing well and, and meeting the needs of the community. So big thank you, Sergey and Manal, for, for taking that on. Uh, and then uh, we've expanded our roster of uh, technical leads uh, in the SIG to include Manal to make sure that we can uh, help navigate uh, tough decision making or conflicts that might arise in the SIG around what to do next and, and how we look to achieve it. Um, big thank you, Renal, for helping uh, grow the team there and uh, uh, look forward to the success that that brings this year. Uh, next ahead, I think Sergey, you're next. I wanted to um, say thank you for uh, all the trust uh, put us to us in the community. And uh, with that, I wanted to talk about how you can, you can contribute to SIG Note. So first of all, um, whenever you contribute and uh, what we ask is uh, to pay attention to stability. Stability always comes first. Uh, any bug fix that you submit without uh, tests uh, raises questions. We need to make sure that uh, we don't introduce new uh, problems and that uh, old features and old behaviors are covered with the test very well. Uh, then we uh, want to make sure that we do optimizations. We uh, Kubelet grows and uh, the workload that we can run is uh, varies significantly from where we started with. That's why evented plug feature is uh, very uh, desired and we worked on it uh, hard and uh, we want more optimizations, more improvements in this space. Uh, then comes features and uh, finally we also care about user uh, and developer experience. So if you can contribute documentation or just give us feedback on PRs and issues, please uh, uh, come and uh, contribute. Uh, you can uh, contribute by attending our SIG meetings. Um, uh, we have two meetings, one for CI and one for our main meeting. Uh, and uh, you can also participate in docs rising and uh, doing some triage for now. You can uh, join the regular meetings on Tuesdays at 10 Pacific and the CI meeting on Wednesdays at 10 Pacific. Uh, we are available on the Signode Slack channel on Kubernetes Slack, and we have a mailing list as well, and know how to reach the chairs and TLs. Well, thanks for uh, joining this talk, and we hope uh, it was useful for you, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you.